Well, hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to another episode of the Civil War Regiments podcast. This is um, actually um, a historical moment in the podcast where it's uh, my first in-studio guest and also our first videotaping of, uh, of an episode uh, in the studio uh, with a guest. And so uh, that's special. I'm kind of excited about that. We even have an audience today. So um, a lot of a lot of firsts uh, today. But uh, the topic of the day is the Austrian Lorenz rifle during the Civil War. And it's a very unique weapon. And uh, we have an expert with us today that knows a lot about the Austrian Lorenz, Mr. Chad Phillips. And uh, he even has a lot of show-and-tell items today, including an original Lorenz. And so uh, I look forward to uh, checking that out and learning a lot more about this uh, unique rifle during the war. And then also uh, my buddy Joseph's here in the audience uh, to check this out because uh, he had to, you know, you just have to see Chad's work in person. Um, and so that's always a, a, a crucial element. So, Chad, welcome to the show today. Oh, thank you, Stephen. It's great to be back, be back here in Alabama with uh, great friends. Uh, you said the term expert. I don't know if I'd go that far, but I, I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just take it. Just take it, Chad. And <laughs> no, I'm happy to have you, sir. And uh, I'm glad I'm to be here. forward to this. And this was actually. Um, Chad's a fan of the show, and we've talked a, a lot over the last few months about potential ideas. And I brought up to Chad before how you know Chad, you're you know a lot about the Lorenz, and if you were ever on the show, that would be a good topic uh, to discuss. And because I really, honestly, know nothing about the Lorenz. You know, I'm more of a uh, I'm more familiar with the basic Enfield rifle, or right. Springfield rifles, the right. more you know commonly used muskets during the war but the lorenz was very unique but also a favorite of many soldiers and so i'm interested to hear all about it uh and but before we go too far i always like to begin with uh having my guests tell us a little bit about themselves and where it all began and where all that history enthusiasm began and and so chad uh where did your interest in civil war history uh begin for you steven it started when i was in third grade uh, we had just began to learn about the American Civil War, and we uh, took a field trip. And, and during the course of this field trip, we were told that we were going to the Atlanta Cyclorama. Uh, and from there on to the state capitol, uh, we would have lunch at Grant Park, which is there on the grounds of the Cyclorama. And from there, we would go to the state capitol. Uh, so that's where um, the interest in the American Civil War began for me. And after that day, I was just completely consumed with the Civil War and uh, at such a young age, I uh, wanted to be a reenactor. Uh, so it just blossomed and grew from there. Wow. Yeah. And um, I always like hearing where it all began and everyone has a little bit of a different uh, story. Like, for example, um, most people say the movie Gettysburg got them in and <laughs> or like uh, um, I just had Dances with Wolves had a shout out the other day as an inspiration. And, uh, but this is the first Atlanta Sakurama inspiration, so uh, that's interesting. And and I bet you know this, um, the location where it's at now is not the original location, correct? Like the Sakurama, where did it used to be again? You know, I know that it's always been in Grant Park um, when I went there, and it's still there today. Okay. Uh, now, they have moved some of the artifacts to, to the Atlanta History Center, but they still have a lot of artifacts there to go and see. It's not something that you want to pass up if you're ever in the Atlanta area. It's definitely something that you want to go and uh, take a look. They've got a small museum, um, and they still have a movie, which was probably the movie that I saw back when I was in third grade that uh, had reenactors in it, and I, I wanted to be that guy. Yeah, yeah. One of those re reenactors. Exactly, and um, a lot of... Um a lot of reenactors have come through Georgia, um, especially in the Atlanta area, and um, so many battles, campaigns, and battlefields in that uh, portion of ground there in north uh, northwest Georgia. But um, I remember, um, I think you were there. I did an event at the La Atlanta History Center, and it was the 150th anniversary of the surrender of, um, I don't know, I forget the exact surrender we were recreating. But, I'm familiar with that. Uh, However, were you there too? I wasn't able to make it. Um, okay, work just gets in the way sometimes. Gotcha, gotcha. But I remember it was hot. It was in the summertime. 
and we did that surrender ceremony and it was a really interesting event but uh but yeah it was hot as all get out but i was really impressed with just the layout and uh it was kind of weird being in this like historic village um and you can see skyscrapers <laughs> right there down the road in downtown atlanta so all it's places. weird yeah right yeah, so uh but i i enjoyed that event it was it was interesting and um i remember they fed us well at that event too but um uh, but I didn't get a chance. I've never actually been to the Psychorama. Um, I know it's probably heresy for some people, but I have. I haven't actually. I haven't even seen the Gettysburg Psychorama. I think it's one of those things where I've seen so many pictures of the Atlanta Psychorama and the Gettysburg Psychorama that I feel like I know them. And I know it's you need to see it in person. Don't get me wrong, but like it's one of those things where every time I'm in the area, I'm kind of like I'm going to spend more time doing something else or checking something else out. Because I feel like, oh, you know, Sakurama is like a, you know, I can see this some other time. But I need to, uh, I need, there's a lot of bucket list items I need to just sort out. And, and eventually, uh, I'll get to that. <laughs> but awesome. So uh, um, I will say, like, where where did, um, where and when did the reenacting become an interest for you? Like, how did that kind of get started? Well, uh, as I was saying, I saw this movie and just so happened uh, I had a fifth grade teacher. Uh, they had attended a reenactment, and we got into the conversation of Civil War reenacting, and he kind of pointed me in the direction of, you know, going to an event. If you can find one at such a young age, I didn't know how, I didn't know how to uh, do that. Uh, years down the road, in 92, when I become a reenactor, I met a good friend of mine uh, by the name of Lee Gilly. Shout out to Lee Gilly if he's listening. And he was a reenactor, uh, and I started in 92 reenacting, and I'm still a reenactor today. Yeah, that's a that's a long time. That's a lot of years of service. Yes, it is. Service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've only I've only been reenacting since um, 2010. Okay, honestly, which uh, I always tell people like I could have been reenacting out of the cradle, but I just didn't I didn't have the connections uh, yet at the time, and you know, and you kind of have to know the right people, meet the right people, and that came later down the road for me. So I was in my 20s by the time I started, but, right? Uh, but now I. I Never looked back and been heavily involved ever since, but awesome. So, again, we're here to talk about the Lorenz. And so, uh, as I mentioned, and as you denied, you know, uh, <laughs> you're an expert on many firearms during the war, and most notably the Austrian Lorenz. But can you explain a little bit about the Lorenz and how it compares to these common rifles like the Enfields and Springfields? Sure. And, uh, What's what is unique about it? Well, you know, I got some notes here, so oh, we got okay. a lot to cover, a lot of ground to yeah. cover, and I brought my notes. Uh, so it was simply known to the Civil War soldier as an Austrian rifle. Uh, to the modern day collector, we know them as the Lorenz. Um, it was introduced into the Habsburg Military Service in 1854. It was designed by Austrian Lieutenant Joseph Lorenz. Um, at 53 inches in length, the Lorenz was slightly shorter uh, than the 1861 U.S. Springfield. Uh, it was 56 inches in total length, and it was also shorter than the 1853 infield, or did I say Springfield? 1861 Springfield is 56 inches in length, and the 1853 infield is 55 inches in length. So the Lorenz was was shorter. Um, the rifle was produced with two types. Of sights that's the only thing that makes them different uh, we have one my personal um, one that I have here uh, has a block rear sight and I'll demonstrate that in a minute how you can tell the difference um, and then the other model is a type 2 now the type 2 and the type 1 the type 1 has a block rear sight which is the one that I have uh, I don't own a type 2 uh, hopefully I will soon or one day <laughs> uh, but it has an adjustable leaf sight okay uh, so that's the difference between the two rifles um, the only visible difference between the two rifles. Yeah, and we were actually just uh, sizing them up uh, before the show, just the, the Enfield and the Lorenz, and we were even, si you know, weighing them to like the weight difference. And um, given the differences, they still weigh very similar, uh, very close to um, how they are. And um, um, so I'm kind of intrigued. Uh, I, I was really intrigued by the the appearance of it. You know, the Lorenz. Uh, as we were saying, almost it has a more artistic feel to it than the basic, if you will, infield. Right. Um, it does have an artsy look about it. The bayonet is different. Uh, the stock is different. 
the way its model is just slightly uh, different than uh, than some of your average firearms. And so, um, you know, I'm curious too. What is the uh, what's the caliber and ammunition that was used compared to um, the other guns? Or does, did it fire the same rounds that you would shoot out of an Enfield? Or what What was the caliber and type of ammo for the Lorenz? Uh, they were designed uh, in fifty four caliber. And also the bullet was designed for this rifle by uh, several tests uh, by the Austrian government. And it was uh, a comp- known as a compression bullet. Um the ones that was imported into the South, all the personal ones that I have, which is three of them, all the ones that I've been able to personally uh, inspect and look at are 54 caliber. Uh, now, there is some that have been bored to 58 and 57 caliber, but most of those were imported by the North. Um, I haven't been known to read anything where the south had 58 or 57 caliber austrian lorenz they were all 54 caliber now there may be something out there that somebody has discovered or there may be some research waiting to be found but through everything that uh, i've read and all the documentation that i've read about this fine military rifle from europe uh, it, when the south imported them they were all 54 caliber yeah wow interesting and um uh, you know, if you if we will uh, go on a little uh, tangent, you know, for the sake of of people who are who are not familiar or hearing about uh, these ammunitions and calibers for the first time, you know, um, what are we talking about again as far as the round that's actually going into uh, the rifle? A fifty four caliber round is smaller in diameter compared to a, a fifty eight caliber round that was used in the U.S. Springfield or the. 1853 infield it was a small round the 54 caliber so that's the difference um the inner uh ammunition was not interchangeable so okay uh, the, the round itself the bullet itself was smaller in diameter um for the springfield or for the infield and would it still with a cartridge still be packaged the same way most other cartridges are you know uh, i mean uh, is it the ball in the uh cartridge and the powder and everything else correct the ball yeah. is the only thing that's smaller uh, the okay. cartridge itself could be um smaller not in length but in diameter due to the paper and the wrapping of the cartridge around the 58 caliber bullet gotcha yeah interesting and um i know um we were talking already too you know how um you know how well, what about the accuracy when it came to <laughs> to uh Lorenz. So, so like uh, how accurate was it compared to a Springfield or an Enfield musket? Well, the two models that I've discussed, the type one and the type two, the type one with the block sight, um, it was known to be accurate out to 246 yards. Um, or an Austrian measurement that was 300 Schritt. That's how they measured it. Okay. Um, and, the Type 2 was accurate out to 900 Schritt, the adjustable rear sight, or 737 yards. So it was very comparable to the infield rifle. And we all know that the infield rifle, the enthusiast that's live fired or uh, the infield or the Springfield, we know that, you know, these rifles are capable of hitting a man sized target easily out to five, six hundred yards. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. And, uh, and, you know, and there's also, you know, a lot of, um, um, well, I should say, first of all, before we go further, you've actually, you have an original right here with us, you have right. an original Lorenz, and you've actually live fired it yourself. I have. And and so walk us through a little bit of, of that. How how did it feel when you were live firing it? You know? It's an experience. Yeah. Um, I'm a, truly amazed at the accuracy of this rifle. Um, it never fails to uh, to deliver. Uh, it's it's a joy to shoot. I enjoy doing live firing with it um and as i've said it's it's very accurate um it is something that i would recommend anyone wanting to fire one of these rifles to you know if available and they've got the opportunity they they need to try it so if the world was about to end next week one of the last things everyone, you need to do. Everyone needs to go buy a uh, Lorenz. Uh, or contact. All doomsday preppers should own a Lorenz. Or, or contact me, and I'll be selling yeah. tickets for yeah. the <laughs> to be able to fire the rifle. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah there you go. That will, 
That will beat the Russians if we all have Lorenzes, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. But, no, uh, um, yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, uh, a lot of um, – I've never live-fired anything, first of all. And so that's, that's – uh, I know there's a lot of uh, – I guess I should say, uh, do you feel nervous when you're live-firing an original weapon, you know, or um, – you know, of damaging it, or how how does it really feel? Yeah, when you're really going, you're you're stepping back in time, if you will, and you're holding a gun that may have been fired during the wartime, right? And right, uh, what's going through your head, pretty much, when you're when you're using an original firearm like that? I'm experiencing what the soldiers, both in the Confederate Army and the Federal Army, experienced. Um, I'm doing something that they both did. However, I'm doing it for for the sake of things i'm doing it just for target practice uh they were doing it because they were in active combat um but it's it's truly uh an experience yeah yeah for sure and i, I need to uh um, gradually uh give it a shot myself <laughs> see i'm curious to see how it feels and how but like right. my thing is um uh, i've never live fired any of them so it's almost like to really get the full experience of what the Lorenz feels like. You need to live fire in Enfield right. or Springfield to, to tell the difference. Right. right. And so um, that's on my bucket list as well to finally do something like that. But um, let's talk about, again, some of these unique features. Okay. Because Lorenz, you know, uh, I noticed just looking at it earlier, it has this cheek rest. Right. And it has um, a unique bayonet and a unique uh, scabbard. But – um. Can you talk a little bit about these details and feel free to, to show sure. a couple of these if you like. But, sure. Well, starting with the cheek rest. Sure. Uh, okay. How and when did that come about in the process? Okay, so all all three of my Austrians, as I said earlier, um, all have a cheek rest. Uh, the Type 1s and the Type 2s did have cheek rest. Now, there were some commercial variants uh, that were imported in to the country that they did not have a cheek rest. This particular model here, as I said earlier, is the one that's got... This is the type one. It's the one that's got the block rear sight. Okay. okay? I don't have a type two uh, to show that it has a folding leaf adjustable okay. rear sight. But this is the type one. The funny thing about the Austrians when they were stamping the lock plates, instead of using a four digit for the year, they used a three digit. So they just simply stamped on this one. It is 859 for 1859. Uh, none of them have the one. Do we know why? Uh, no, I can't seem to locate why the Austrians would do such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they want to be unique, obviously. Yeah, well, they uh, trendy, maybe. Yes. Uh, it's almost. Uh, I wonder if anyone is ever confused. Like, I mean, it's obvious maybe to figure out that it's the year. Or I wonder if anybody ever thought it, that was like an inventory number. Um, if that ever had confusion, but um, I mean, how many years? I guess when what was the first year it was produced and what was the last year it, it was, was produced it was produced in 1854 yeah so that's as early as it goes that's as early as it goes when but it was then, introduced into military service and then how late were they made till 1862 okay um, so you're not you're only going to have between 854 and 862 on there okay right so another distinctive feature about the 1862 models they're going to have an English infield style lock plate. And the barrels were made out of steel. This particular model here has an iron barrel. And so it, the ones before 1862 were unique. Okay. Uh, and, and the least. Sure. Um, other than the lock plate on the 62s, um, that's the difference between these and the ones produced earlier. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I like the unique uh, look it has, you know, and and I guess when you're when you're holding it too, how does the cheek rest feel compared to when you're holding the Enfield, and d does it feel natural or you know how does it feel when you're kind of getting the when you shoulder the the musket? Mm -hmm. um, there is a an area that the cheek rest helps when you're trying to shoulder the musket. You're preparing to live fire, so it does help. Um, another interesting note about this rifle is that they were all made out of European red beech. Okay. So it's not uncommon to have an Austrian that may have what we call drying cracks. Uh, it could be here in the stock, the toe of the stock, um, sometimes in the ramrod channel. 
this one here is in really good shape. I've got to say, not because it's mine uh, and I'm being biased, but yeah. uh, this one here is in really good shape. And you own you own a few of them, right? I have three, and they're all and type ones. Are all of them as in? Is this the best shape of all the ones you have, or all of them pretty uh, pretty good? All of them are in real good shape. Yeah. Uh, you take good care of them, don't you? I keep them stored up and only get yeah. them out for special occasions. <laughs> so you should feel honored. I do. I do. I feel honored uh, to get this out of the closet for today. And so, um, um, I, I will say. Uh, I think you already mentioned this, but like, have you actually used this one at, in a reenactment? I have taken it to uh, Living Histories. Okay. I've taken it out to Living okay. Histories, and I have used it one time. And as we said earlier in the show, the nervousness yeah. that one will experience making sure that nothing happens to sure. it. Um, when it's one-on-one, uh, you and I at the range, we can – we can be careful with it. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, but when you're around a bunch of guys that you don't know at a mainstream event yeah. or at a reenactment. There's a lot uh, more risk involved. A lot more risk involved. Yeah, sure. So I only get it out for special occasions. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm honored. Very good, sir. Thank you. Um, and watch the ceiling fan. <laughs> we're, we're, it's a small studio. Uh, but, um, um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the bayonet then. Sure. And, uh, and you were showing us earlier um, how unique it is, and you could even compare the bayonet with the um, Enfield bayonet to kind of show us a, a difference there. But uh, but the Lorenz bayonet had a unique design to it. Right. Well, I have one with us today. Okay. And this is original too? This is an original one as well. All right, so here's the difference between – an original Lorenz bayonet, and we have a reproduction. Now, the reproduction for the infield is a close copy. Sure. So what we have here, this is what we call a quadrangular bayonet. Uh, and the Springfields pretty much utilize the same bayonet. The Austrians had a cruciform or a four-blade bayonet. Um, and the Mortise section, it has a slot diagonal slot so when you mount it to the muzzle of the rifle it has a twisting motion okay and i'll be more than happy to demonstrate that oh wow yeah that'd be cool okay so so we yeah. here as you can see the diagonal slot yeah and i didn't even notice that when i was holding it earlier the how it's at an angle like that right oh, that's really cool so you can see the diagonal slot sure and as you mount it to the top of the rifle, you can see it has wow. a twist in motion. That's really cool. As it locks in place. Yeah. Now, if you will, if you were to ask, and I think sure. that you may, well, will the infield bayonet go in there? Well, oh, that's the well, question. Yeah. Well, let's find out. Let's see. No. And do we know why it won't go in there? Well, it's not made for it. Yeah. That would be the answer. Yeah. But also. Interesting. Also, the front side is very unique on the Austrians okay. because the the blade is is straight, but the mount itself has an angle to it to assist the bayonet as it's mounted and the twisted motion. Wow, that's really cool. I I never noticed that detail, so that's that's really fascinating to me. But so I imagine. Um, during the war itself too like uh, so because it had to be a unique bayonet if, if somebody lost the bayonet then they just they, they had to deal with it i guess you know unless they could find a replacement an exact replacement or if they got one issued to them mm -hmm. um without the bayonet no other bayonets will fit this rifle not in my personal experience you were asking earlier another unique feature about this rifle that i'd like to add it was considered a three-band rifle much like the springfields and the infields sure um the top band also acted as a nose cap. Okay. Another interesting feature about it is the trumpet for the ramrod, yeah. for the brass tip of the ramrod. So the ramrod has a swell. As you seat the ramrod, this swell is going to be pretty close or at the bottom of the trumpet as you seat the ramrod. Yeah. And uh, I was even remarking how that's a unique design, and it almost looks like something that'd be on the side of a musical instrument. <laughs> and right, uh, and right. maybe it's the Austrians did love music, maybe. So uh, uh, it almost looks like you could sit here and play this somehow, Chad. <laughs> maybe. Have you ever tried to make music? Uh, 
<laughs> I haven't tried to make besides it. the big boom boom music. Right, though. that's the only music. Uh, but wow, that's that's. I don't know. I'm fascinated by that scabbard, and I know um, and the bayonet. I mean, but uh, but we don't have a scabbard today. But was the scabbard unique in, in design? It was very unique as well. It was okay. made out of the same wood. It was made out of European red beech. Okay, wrapped in leather, okay. and it was iron mounted, meaning that it had a iron cap at the top of the scabbard, and it had an iron tip. Yeah, uh, they were worn on a shoulder belt. Okay, and it was either on the left side or the right side, according if the soldier was right-handed or left-handed. Okay. Um, and they were worn on a shoulder belt, not like on belts and frogs like we hear, okay. like we wear here okay. in the states. Interesting. And um, I do want to go back to the bayonet too. Uh, you were talking about how a unique feature is the bayonet's in a cruciform shape. Right. And so uh, why is that, if you will, uh, to explain to us, why did they go with that design? The Austrians designed it like this, so if they use it against the enemy, it would make uh, it would make a, an, a puncture wound to where it couldn't be stitched up. Mm. Uh, so if infection didn't get you, um, if he was to hit a vital organ with that, either way, it would. It yeah. being being on the business end uh, of a cruciform bayonet is not where I want to find myself. Yeah, yeah. So I thought maybe the Austrians were trying to uh, convert their victims to Christianity with the with, with the a cruciform, cruciform bayonet. Shape. But uh, um, they well, that they put some thought behind that then um, to uh, really uh, lethal in the design uh, the to cause and inflict damage. And so yeah, I, I guess the Enfield bayonet being more of a flat design a flat versus cruciform flat is easier to stitch right so right i see well and and i know um a myth if you will in the war is that a lot of people think bayonets were used a lot more and they weren't um it was more terrifying uh a, bayonet a fear charge, factor than it was a fear yeah. factor yeah, yeah absolutely a uh, a bayonet charge coming at you was sure uh, from the accounts and the diaries that I've read of soldiers that they were more fearful of receiving a wound from a bayonet than a bullet. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I know, uh, that had to be a terrifying ordeal to be on the receiving end of that, of a bayonet charge. And, and I, I do think it's documented that bayonet deaths is one of the lowest causes of deaths of civil war soldiers. Right. You know, a lot of people right. imagine that bayonets were used a lot more, but it didn't always come down to that. But, um, man, I just thought of a, that made me think of another question and, um, I can't remember now, but, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it come, just came back to me. So I'm just curious, you know, uh, we all in the reenacting hobby, you know, obviously we were all trained in the stacking of arms. Correct. And so was there any difference in the way, because of the unique shapes and sizes of the Lorenz, I mean, was stacking, just as simple and easy as stacking Enfield. Sure. Or was there any different trick to it? No, it was it was the same manual of arms that okay. the soldiers used. Okay. Um, so it was very easy to to stack as stacking an Enfield or a Springfield. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, uh, like I said, I'm learning myself today, and and so uh, um, so to go back into the history of the Lorenz again, you know, so. When, where, and how, basically, did the Lorenz make its entrance into the United States? And, you know, and uh, was it used by uh, both sides? Was it only used by Confederates, only used by Federals, or, or both sides during the war? How and where did that all come about? You know, they were imported into the States in early 1862. Uh, both armies were armed with the Lorenz. Um, uh, and the Federal Army, they were... It, they were used uh, and issued during the in time for the campaigns of the spring in 1862. Uh, they were also imported into the South. The documentation that I've read on them, they were coming in to Wilmington, North Carolina, and also into um, there was one documentation I read that uh, a blockade runner brought some into Savannah and okay. early on, uh, uh, and also they were coming into uh, Virginia as well. Um, do we know like how many like were were coming over? Uh, there's there's estimates that a hundred thousand were imported into the South. Okay, um, 
and into the north, it was over 200,000 that was imported in into gotcha. the north. Okay. The interesting fact um, of the ones coming into the north, now they did have 54 calibers, but for the, to standardize the ammunition that was used for the Springfield, uh, a lot of theirs were bored to 57 or 58 caliber to, de- to utilize the 58 caliber ammunition that was uh, distributed to the federal soldiers. So how walk walk us through that if you will for people that don't understand uh how does that work <laughs> what you just said okay so the federal government wanted to ensure that that um 58 caliber ammunition uh, that the rifles the springfield was 58 caliber so uh, you can imagine the confusion uh, especially in battle uh, of needing to get or uh, distributing 54 caliber ammo mm-hmm. uh, to a group of guys that are all you mm-hmm. know armed with 58 caliber Springfields and maybe one or two of the guys uh, were armed with an Austrian Lorenz and 54 caliber. Uh, so the federal government wanted to standardize that and had some of theirs um, bored out to 57 and 58 caliber. Uh, in the South, they remained 54 caliber. Okay. Uh, the South did not, to my knowledge, um, they did not bore theirs out there. All, all three of mine are true 54 caliber Austrians. And what kind of work did that entail to bore it out? You know, like, uh... they um, they were sent to at the time if it was, you know, Harper's Ferry that could have been um, doing the machine work on them. You know, um, just basically making the bore larger. Okay. Um, to accept fifty eight caliber ammunition. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Um, uh, they 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 had to do. Uh, I had to go out of their way to uh, to do a lot of stuff like that. I guess turn out to... right, right. Well, so um, so now that these Lorenzes have entered the United States, in crucial time as this, um, so were entire were there enough to supply an entire regiment uh, with the Lorenz, or was it more of a was it a case where you'd have a regiment? With eight companies with Enfield and fields and two companies with Lorenzes, or were were entire regiments equipped with it? That seems to be uh, the way that they were issued. I know companies were issued Lorenz rifles. Um, uh, I know in 1864, uh, the Army of Tennessee, one third of that army was shouldered this fine musket in 1864. And we're talking one third of the one third of the army. So uh, they were very prevalent in the Army of Tennessee. The Lorenz rifles not only served here in the Western Theater, but also the Eastern Theater uh, in okay. the Army of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, these rifles were used as far west as Glorietta Pass, New Mexico. So it's um, wow. some of that information is is is, yeah. is not as available um, mm-hmm. as of right now. It's not as available now. There is um, artifacts that's been found out there uh pertaining to the austrian rifle oh so we do know that they were issued they were out there sure and then and uh we were even talking earlier i guess that's where when you can get your hands on the ordinance reports correct um depending on what when and where they filled them out in the years you know you could you could see what units may have been issued uh the lorenz and um i will give a, a kind of shout out to um plug for the new website researcharsenal.com absolutely um i just signed up for that uh just the other day and i've been using it but they have that website program too where they have so many letters and reports and photographs on this site that if you go on there and you search like if you just search lorenz so if you're listening to the show right now and you go on there go on that website and search lorenz it's going to pull up any image that they have uploaded to the site you know most of them are from the library of congress They'll pull up any image with a soldier holding a Lorenz, and uh, it's really fascinating. Of course, one of the first ones that came up was a, a group of soldiers of the Iron Brigade, the 2nd Wisconsin, Correct. Um, holding uh, the Lorenz, and a fascinating image, a really detailed image. And uh, so, yeah, and then you could even go on there and see if any soldiers wrote about it in letters. Um, so it's kind of fascinating. That, Stephen, that particular image that you're talking about, yeah. the 2nd Wisconsin, We'll try to put it on the screen too for those. Sure, sure for the watching. viewers. Yeah, yeah for the viewers. Uh, those soldiers in that um, all have type twos with the adjustable okay. rear sight. So it's it's uh, to me it's it's telling me that that particular rifle, the type two, was issued in large quantities. Hmm. Um, 
the ones that were issued to the Army of Tennessee, from what I've the research that I've I've done, um, I'm not saying that the Type Two wasn't issued. It just appears to be that the Type One was more prevalent. Okay, and you know, uh, to rewind a little bit, you know, what was the length of or time of production for the, the Lorenz, if you will, like? Uh, how long, like, what did it take longer to produce those versus Enfields and Springfields, or were they just the same? And how much could they keep up with production wise? Not in the Austrian uh, government. They were, you know, they were already introduced and they were already set up and machining uh, the rifle. Uh, as I said earlier, they were already starting to make the transition to the 1862s. So a lot of the uh, the one, the earlier ones. Um, 1854s were surplus. They were being sold off. Yeah. So when the federal government and the Confederate States government um, had the opportunity to buy the surplus arms, they were buying large quantities of them. Sure. Wow. And um, so going back to we were we were talking about the Iron Brigade. We mentioned them. Shout out, you know. And so they're they're a famous Union Brigade during the war. And um, and I know uh, with the studies done with the Battle of Gettysburg, for example. They show that many of the regiments of the Iron Brigade were armed with the Lorenz at Gettysburg. Correct. And so I'm curious, like, if you're familiar with any stories, accounts, or anecdotes of any Iron Brigade soldiers that may have uh, used it at Gettysburg, or, or, or for that matter, you know, any soldier that's written anything about using it in combat. Have you come across any accounts like that? I do. I do. I have two accounts. One of them is a um, an account. Um, I'm going to refer to my notes. Um, there's an account given by Private Alfred Bellard. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in the 5th New Jersey Infantry. I think I have his book. You have that book? Yeah. Is it Gone for a Soldier, I think? I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. I think I have that. Big library across the hall here. Yeah. <laughs> a wealth of information. <laughs> um, he was at the Second Battle of Bull Run. Okay. Um, we call it Second Manassas. I guess it just depends on what side of the Mason-Dixon line that you're standing on and how you refer to it. I, yeah, you know, exactly, I've, yeah. I've been told it's Bull Run up north and yeah. or Bull Run in the south and well, Manassas yeah. up north. Of I think course. I, think I had it back. A Union man like yourself would say Bull Run. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, this was in August of 1862, and he writes, he says, I was pinned down by a Confederate whose shots flew unnervingly close. A friend came to my aid and who was my comrade mm. uh, and he was on his left. So they're in, they're in active combat. Okay. Okay. Uh, he said that his comrade made his Austrian speak and there is one less in the Confederate army. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's one account from, from combat. Interesting. Um, I have another one here from Leander Steelwell. Um, he was in the 61st Illinois. Yeah. I think uh, I have his book too. <laughs> He uh, he said that uh, him and his comrades were glad to get the Austrians, and they were quite proud of them. Uh, Stillwell thought his Lorenz to be a wicked shooter. Mm. So it'd be interesting to know if that was a fifty four caliber, okay. um, if it was a Type 1, Type 2. Was it one of the ones that they were issuing out that had been reboard the fifty eight caliber? I'd be interesting to know, it'd be interesting to know. I wish I knew. Yeah, yeah. I will say, uh, how were you able to kind of pinpoint some of those accounts? You know, did you have, did you have to try to do a word search through some diaries to try to find those? Or? Well, you know, just through uh, research, just yeah, uh, reading some diaries and sure, you know, sure. and um, making little notations every time I come across awesome. um, yeah. a soldier yeah. describing his rifle, a Lorenz rifle. And and again, hopefully, uh, some of these online tools will will help us with that um, as time goes on. And I know it's a uh, my my problem, and maybe you can agree with me uh, on this, Chad, that I've read so many books over the years, come across so many accounts that, like, I can remember a sentence and, like, a really cool thing a soldier said, but then for the life of me, I can't remember which book I got it from. I run into that and all I'm the like, time. Hey, like, I, I read all these accounts, and I, I'll remember them. They stick with me, but then I forget which one and where. And so it happens to make quite often. Hard. Yeah. It's a hard thing when you research it. So, so yeah, you have to take notes and, and, um, or, you know, I hate dog earing books, but sometimes you got to when you want to try to remember. Uh, I, I usually end up putting little paper tabs in my books. Like, I hate folding the page. So I'll just get little strips of paper 
and put them in the books that I want to remember uh, right. to go back to. And and I hate highlighting too. Don't highlight books like that. I don't know. Um, I'm not I'm not a fan of that. Especially don't if you have an original book too. Not highlight. But um, which I don't have any original books. Most of mine are reprints. But um, but awesome. Yeah. Wow. So uh, but that's cool. Uh, did you have any more accounts or those those are the ones? Those are the two accounts yeah. that I wanted to. Well, that's good. Well, that gives us a little taste of there. combat and a little taste of uh, the opinions um, that soldiers had on that. So that's fascinating. And again, yeah, go to a website like Research Arsenal and type in Lorenz and maybe on your own journey, try to find some accounts and entries and then, right. and share those with us so Chad can add those to his collection. Uh, absolutely. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, That'd be great. Yeah, I'm looking to add anything. Oh, yeah. Because one day you're going to eventually write a book about Lorenz, I'm sure, right? You know, there's books out there in production. Uh, I'm yeah. not familiar with them, um, yeah. but there are some books out there that, that are available, and they have some information uh, on this cool. yeah. fine European firearm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, But we're just waiting for yours, Chad. You'll you'll be there eventually. And then I could display your book over here with all the With all your books? All the props. <laughs> okay. Yeah, these are just cardboard cutouts. I don't really publish books. <laughs> You have, a, you have a you have a writer to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who's my ghost writer? Um, the soldiers themselves, actually. I let I always tell I let the soldiers themselves tell tell the history for me. You know, because um, um, no matter what I do, you know, I I can research and all that. But like, um, you got to hear from the eyewitnesses and people that were there, and right. And that's what's fascinating about. That's why we as living historians were constantly reading these diaries and these uh, accounts because um, by being living historians, we're able to understand, you know, we're never going to be exactly like how they were. We're not ever going to be on the same part as they were in that time. Right, right. But when we read this, because we experience what it's like to camp and what it's like to carry the, these accoutrements and, and weapons when we read them and and hear how they describe it, we can understand it a little easier than somebody just coming across a book on a bookshelf without any prior knowledge. We can kind of we can understand and and relay that knowledge um, a little bit better because um, we 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 see it we test it firsthand. So you have marched, I'm sure, with holding the Lorenz, and you've used it now. Uh, you said you've live fired it and you've used it at a at events, but. Um, and you've also, uh, so I'll, I'll pose this question to you. So I'm sure you've used an Enfield, you've used a, a Springfield, you've used the Lorenz. So of all three of those in your own experience, whether live hey. firing or reenacting, which one is your go-to? Hands down the Lorenz. <laughs> I'm a Lorenz fanatic. Uh, yeah. it's just the way that the rifle shoulders it's to me, it's, it just seems like it knows where to go and what to do. Okay. Uh, it's to me, it's now, this is, you know, my personal opinion. I think it's just a little bit lighter, lighter in weight than the infield or the Springfield. Okay. Um, it's the soldiers thought that they were short and handy. Uh, and I can relate to that. Uh, it's a little bit shorter, uh, than the Springfield and infield. Okay. Um, like I said, it's a little lighter. Mm -hmm. It's not a, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not drastically light, if I could use that yeah, word. Yeah, That's yeah. even a word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, drastically light, is that a word? Uh, but it's uh, to me, it's it's a little bit lighter, um, okay. but uh, it's because it's handy um, and it's a little bit shorter. Um, it it just it just feels, to me, it feels much better okay. um, to shoulder and to march with over the infield or a spring field. Yeah. But that's my personal opinion now. Yeah. So, what do I have to do in order to borrow your original Lorenz at an event? Um, <laughs> my mortgage. I can give you the exact payoff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's five hundred dollars per event, right? Yeah. You know, speaking of that, um, I really get a joy out of doing living histories and taking it along. Um, sure. When you produce the bayonet and the Lorenz to someone that's never had the opportunity to hold an original firearm from uh, the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Just seeing the look on their face is, you know, they're just truly amazed that they get to see it. They're standing on, you know, they're not standing on the opposite side of the glass in a museum getting to look at one. Sure. Uh, they're actually sure. there able yeah. to to hold it and, and feel the weight. And, and in a way, in a sense, they can kind of connect to, 
how the soldier felt when he was holding on to it. You know, it's an actual, you know, it's it's a relic. Mm-hmm. It, it's an original piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I really enjoy talking to the public about it and um, and sure showing them, uh, you know, helping them to understand um, the difference in the different rifles. Uh, I like to call my pards over and, you know, if they've ar- if they're armed with an infield or a spring field, I can kind of show the difference and talk a little bit about. It. I could talk about this rifle all day long. Yeah, yeah. And how many times have you slept with your Lorenz at an event? At an event, <laughs> uh, every time I've ever had it. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, but uh, uh, have you ever had any close calls where? Um, uh, have you ever had it at a rainy event or something where you got a little nervous having the original out there in the environment or? Uh, any close calls in damaging your original? The cl- one of the close calls I had, um, I was beside a younger reenactor. Um, he was a little bit, a little bit too careless mm-hmm. for me. Um, so in trying to shield mine, uh, my Lorenz, my rifle, uh, from him and him being on, you know, my right side. Uh, so I was, I was a little nervous that he was uh, going to be too careless mm-hmm. and you know either add a a dent or a scratch or or some type of damage to it once it's there it's there yeah um so uh that was the one and only time i took it to an event uh, and i decided from that day on i'll take it to the range or either i'll take it to a living history that sure. um you know once these once these relics are gone you know they're they're gone yeah yeah sure well you know i should take this opportunity you know the um I staged this whole interview just to reveal that that was me. That was my first event. I was that guy. And uh, I hope you'll forgive me now. But <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> Do you remember me, Chad? Uh, <laughs> but no, I understand. Yeah, there there is a lot of um, um, precautions you have to take when you, when you uh, bring these originals out. And uh, I, I will say, um, so... Given if you lie, fire, or ever take it out like you do, and and maybe even after this podcast, like what th- does it um, cleaning the originals does it entail a lot more than the reproductions? Like you know, how easy is it it to uh, clean? It's the same process as yeah. as trying to clean an original or mm-hmm. cleaning an original. It's the same process. Yeah. Um, like there's nothing in the cleaning processes that could damage it. No, no. Okay. Not, not any type of uh, just regular cleaning that you would do to an infield or spring field. Okay. It's the same process you, you would do to one of these to an original. Sure. And now do you have any of these displayed in your home or are they all put away? They're all, <laughs> they're all under lock and key. <laughs> so you don't have it over your fireplace. You don't have uh, it mounted. No, I do not. <laughs> awesome. But, uh, um, so yeah, that's really interesting. And, you know, and I know, um, we, we touched a little on it, but like, um, in your own research, then you've come across, you know, do you have any books that you've read or websites that you've used the kind of, um, if you will, for anyone that's kind of interested in learning more about the Lorenz or even firearms in general in the war, do you have any recommended websites or books that kind of, uh, helped with that? You know, Get on the internet and typing in the word Austrian Lorenz, everything pops up. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as books goes, as I was saying earlier, I'm not really familiar. I know there's some out there that are um, available. I'm just not familiar with them. Um, but as far as being able to research it online, there's a wealth of information about this um, musket online. Sure, sure. And um, what about like, um, are there any books out there? I'm, I'm curious for myself too. Like, is there like a good book? just for someone to be introduced to firearms during the civil war. Are you familiar with any, like um, I could go, is there a go-to study? I'm sure there is in my mind is drawing the blank, but like, is there a go-to book to kind of just dive into learning everything you know about firearms? There is some books out there, as I was saying earlier, I'm just not familiar with them. Yeah. Um, but there is some books out there about uh, military long arms, military mm-hmm. firearms, and that may be the name of the book and I just don't know it. Yeah. You know, that's, but uh, but there is some out there sure. for anyone looking to uh, educate themselves or just simply uh, wanting some reading entertainment. Awesome, mm-hmm. yeah. And um, I'll and I always try to put show notes together. So if I come across any in the editing, um, I'll be sure to tag some some products too in there. But um, 
you know, I'm curious too, and going back a little bit again, this show is uh, so four regiments, and I also like to kind of, uh, as we wind down a little bit, you know, talk a little bit about, um, actually, I forgot, you have a couple of other things to show us. Oh, absolutely. What are those? Um, you had some uh, tools that yeah, came to the Lorenz. I got some tools. All right, so we do know that some implement tools were issued with these rifles mm-hmm. along with the bayonets and the scabbards. Now, in the South, it, it appears that the Austrian scabbard um, was used. Okay. Up north, they uh, had contractors, and the federal government had contractors making scabbards uh, for their Austrian bayonets. Um, I have here what is commonly referred to as a wiper. Okay. Um, and that's an original. Okay. And then this is a reproduction. Um, this is a gun tool. And the interesting thing about it has a Could screwdriver. Sure. Interesting thing about it is that it has a screwdriver, a pin punch, okay. and a nipple wrench all in one. Wow. That's a unique shape there, yeah. <laughs> and so, and, and soldiers, how and where would they carry these? Would they carry these in their cartridge boxes? In their cartridge haversacks? boxes, haversacks, pockets. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. The thing to know uh, about implement tools, well, how do we know? How do we know that these are... Um, were were imported with a rifle sure well talk to a relic hunter go to a civil war relic show they love to talk about their finds um they really enjoy talking to the public okay. about what they're finding and relic hunters are a wealth of information i had a good friend sure uh, he's since deceased named mark pollard okay uh, rest in peace mark pollard but he could uh he could tell you um who was camped where and what he was finding. So he could tell yeah. you, you know, he's very knowledgeable. He had a, uh, a museum of artifacts that he had okay. found. Um, so he would all through uh, the Atlanta campaign. He's probably hunted from Chattanooga to Savannah, Georgia. Uh, so yeah. he was able to find some very unique things. Um, okay. and, and like I said, relic hunters there, uh, They've got the information because they're out there uh, and they're digging it. Yeah. Uh, so the relic hunters are someone you want to talk to. If you got a particular question about a button, a buckle, a gun wiper. Yeah. You know, so uh, they're, they're finding it. And they, well, they're, I, I imagine you've probably been to a lot of relic shows and you've probably right. been to a lot of gun shows. Right. And do you, how often do you come across parts and original Lorenzes at relic shows and gun shows are, are they pretty common or are they kind of rare to come across it? uh they're they're common now they are because everybody knows what they are and the prices mm-hmm. uh are are matching that <laughs> so um yeah and years ago um you could find an austrian um in a shape like the one i have here to my right uh, and you may be able to pay somewhere between seven hundred to nine hundred dollars for one uh now this rifle's going for um somewhere between 14 to really? 1700 bucks just depends on the condition of it okay. and what you're willing to pay mm-hmm. um so uh they're very unique uh austrians they stand out uh, because yeah. of their features so okay. once you see one um you know what you're looking at sure he, sure interesting and um now, now that I know what to look for now, um, you know, I, a lot of these features are so unique and the parts are so unique, the bayonets so unique so that, uh, yeah, if you just came across a stack of bayonets, you could pick out like, oh my gosh, that's a Lorenz bayonet. Right. Or, and right. All that. And, um, well, I guess I should say like, um, what's the most similar gun? Like, is there any gun out there that uh, has a very similar design, like with that bayonet? Or is it all these things, the cheek rest, the bayonet, is that all very unique to the Lorenz? It's very unique to the Lorenz. Okay. So not many, there's not many uh, uh, copies out there. In other <laughs> right. <laughs> now, there is a reproduction that's currently being made. Really? Uh, yes, there is. It's made by Petersoli, David Petersoli. Okay. So they're currently making a... Austrian Lorenz is the Type 2 model. It's got okay. the adjustable rear side on it. Has anyone else reproduced them? Or no, as of made? right now, they're okay. the only uh, Italian manufacturer. Okay. You know, they make fine mm-hmm. reproductions mm-hmm. Uh, for those of us in the hobby. Sure. Uh, that's where we have to go to to get any of our reproduction yeah. muskets. So they're still practice. around. Petersoli is. Yeah, they're still active. Okay. They're uh, 
Wow. The, they're the ones that's still in the yeah. business and making fine reproductions every yeah. day. Yeah. Well, that's, well, stay tuned for that then. Wow. That'll be interesting. Um, so as we kind of wind down and, and going back to where I was, uh, in a way, um, I kind of like to conclude too with a little more, uh, personal questions about, um, uh, cause I'm curious myself, you know, like, uh, is there a favorite battlefield if you were Chad? Is there a favorite location or battlefield that you just like to go to and whether it's, uh, for fun or whether it's for research or whatever for meditation, even is there a specific battlefield or location that you just tend to go to a lot? I've always been connected to the battle of Versailles. Okay. I've always enjoyed going there. Uh, it's a mainstream event for those of us that are in the hobby. We we know what mainstream means, um, but it's very enjoyable to go there. Um, well, the battlefield is well preserved, um, it, especially the new portion that's been opened. It is, uh, yeah, and it's one of the few battlefields that's uh, not been developed. It, yeah. It's one of the uh, battlefields on the Atlanta campaign, sure, uh, that you can actually go to, and it's um, it, there's very little change. Uh, with you know, with building and construction yeah. or anything of that nature, it, there's no an interstate runs through it, unfortunately. But uh, right, and right. Uh, and and shout out, uh, I just did a few weeks ago. I did an episode all about the Battle for Saka, and um, and we talk about the battlefield and what's preserved out there. So please go back and check out that episode uh, to learn more. But you know, I tell uh, when I'm asked, you know, if I want to go to a reenactment. You know, in Georgia, where would I go to? I always recommend the Battle of Resaca mm-hmm. uh, because of uh, the viewing point, uh, the hilltop where the spectators are able to view the full battle um, and its location. It's easy sure. accessible. There's lots sure. of parking. Yeah. Uh, there's some good vendors there. You can get food. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, that reminds me, too, speaking of the reenactment, um, we both recreated the uh, 8th Missouri Zouaves uh, right, right. just recently, this past event, and we're going to do it again next year. Right. And uh, I just got my own jacket. <laughs> uh, I bought it uh, the other day, uh, so I'll show you after this. But um, you have – did you get your own or did you borrow the one you had? I've got you, my own. Yeah, yeah I've got so my own. So we're all part of the club now. <laughs> right. We're right. all the cool so, kids. Uh, that's cool. Uh, I look forward to uh, the next Rusak uh, for that. But um, – you know what I will say, and, and uh, I may catch you off guard a little bit, but, you know, uh, do you have any personal, um, and this could be any topic in a war, but, like, do you have any personal favorite books that you're that are your go-to, whether it's studying the war in general or a specific battle or a regiment? Is there any go-to books that you kind of enjoy? I have one. It's called um, Blockade Runners of the Confederacy. Okay. It's a joy to read. There's a lot of information in that book, but I will say that my favorite book to read, and I've read this book probably 10 times, and I'll probably read it 10 times more um, because there's always something that I forget. Uh, it's called Wolf of the Deep. Oh, I've heard of that one. It's about uh, the CSS Alabama okay. and Raphael Sims. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite books. Um, but then if I put it down beside Company H with Sam Watkins, yeah. You know, that's another favorite book of mine. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I've got Echoes of Glory that I love to sit and just thumb mm-hmm. through. Uh, the pages are worn. I've had this book for 30 years. Yeah. And yeah. I, I just I just enjoy uh, all these books. Well, a lot of these books, especially the ones with images in them, like have there been many times where you're scrolling through a photograph, photograph book of the war and your just eye knows how to catch a Lorenz. Like, do you find that a lot? Like, I do. If you're scrolling through a book, do you just go like, "Oh, that guy's holding Lorenz." I do, I do. And when I look at old <laughs> photographs, uh, if yeah. if I see one, I spot one immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Or the word Lorenz, or fifty four caliber Austrian. Yeah. Well, do you ever try to collect images? Do you ever try to collect images? Like, if you if you go to a relic show, like if you come across a tin type. Oh yeah. Little, oh yeah. My phone's full of them. Yeah. Yeah. My phone's yeah. full of yeah. images. I'm sure. Sure. Well, yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. But, um, and I guess uh, one of our final questions is to, uh, do you have uh, a personal favorite? You know, I always ask everyone, but like, do you have a personal favorite regiment uh, either side that you kind of, um, you tend to go to and, and um, study a lot, you know? The Army of Tennessee. Okay. I love anything on the mm-hmm. Army of Tennessee. My favorite yeah. general uh, is Joe Johnston. Okay. The troops loved okay. him. They called him old Joe. Yeah. Uh, he's my favorite, my general, my favorite general of the whole war. Yeah. Uh, anything on the Army of Tennessee, Patrick Claiborne, his mm-hmm. division, uh, General Govan, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so anything to do with, you know, those hard fighting Army of Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, they, they definitely um, they had their share of renowned uh, commanders and generals. Uh, I think the Army of Tennessee is even more so known for their brigade, division, corps commanders. You know, and, right, right. Uh, but also, you know, every regiment in the Army of Tennessee has a storied history in a sense. They were a very um, hard, hard fighting group of men. The Army of Tennessee. So. Yes, they were. They were. Yeah. Uh, they were a hard luck army. They were made. They were just made different in the West, weren't they? They uh, were Union and Confederate. Uh, those it, guys were a different breed of soldier. They were. They were yeah. truly a different breed of soldier. Um, you know, we all know that. You know, they were farm boys. Yeah. Uh, not to take away from some of the other uh, jobs that uh, federal or sure uh, or or Confederates may have have may have had. Excuse me. Before the war, uh, but it seems to be that mm. Mm, the farm boys were. You know, they were tough as nails, so to speak. Yeah. Well, um, I do, uh, as we conclude here, uh, do you have, did we miss anything in particular about the Lorenz? And do you have any parting message overall in your general opinion of the Lorenz and just what you really like about it? It's because it's unique uh, in its features, uh, everything from its caliber to uh, just the way it was designed, uh, this this rifle was designed from the ground up by Joseph Lorenz. Uh, everything from the compression bullet to the bayonet to the features, in my opinion, this rifle was way ahead of its time. Okay. Um, it, it was offered, you know, in a Type 1 and a Type 2. Uh, your first rank and second rank uh, of an infantry unit in Austria was armed with the Type 1. Uh, the third rank in sharpshooters and NCOs was armed with um, the adjustable sight, the, the Type 2s. Um, Another interesting note about this rifle is uh, the bottom of the uh, the, the breech. Mm-hmm. It's one millimeter in diameter larger than the rest of the barrel. Okay. Uh, the Austrians, by the thinking process behind that for the Austrians was that the powder, once it become a gas, going from a solid to a gas, it was able to ex- ignite and expand, uh, pushing the rear of the bullet the rings into the grooves of the barrel to give it the spinning motion to make it more accurate. So as I said, this rifle was way ahead of its time. Uh, Nothing to take away. I'm not taking anything away from Enfields or Springfields or any other fine military rifles that were produced during that time. But the Austrian Lorenz was very unique. Wow. Um, You know, that just led me to think of one question. Like, is there a modern firearm counterpart that you would compare to like a, if you had to compare it to modern enthusiasts and modern weaponry, like how would Lorenz stand up to you know some of our modern weapons? Some of our modern weapons, I would personally, I would say that for the AR crowd that's out there, the AK crowd, AK-47 lovers mm-hmm. or AR-15 lovers, I would say that uh, this rifle was, that's what it was okay. at that time okay. period. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Well, well Chad, uh, I want to thank you for uh, sharing all this. It's with great us to be today. here. A lot of show and tell here. It's great to be here. <laughs> and really enjoyed it. Those of you uh, watching and, and uh, listening on social media, I'll put um, some closer images of this, and then during the show, um, we'll go back and uh, give you some more close-up images of these differences and uniqueness of the Lorenz. But uh, this was great. This was a good. Um, in studio episode and so i appreciate you being on the show man and uh it was a pleasure to be here shout out to our audience member joseph for sitting here quietly and peacefully um i hope i hope the audience has enjoyed this episode (laughs) two thumbs up i believe we just got so um i think those were thumbs i think he yeah it was two thumbs up (laughs) but uh chad uh thanks again and um thank you uh i look forward to uh more episodes to come uh for this season uh it's been a a great season so far. I've really enjoyed a lot of the episodes this year. And so please go back. If you've missed a few episodes the last few weeks and months, go back and check out what we already have to offer and stay tuned for more episodes to come. But uh, I thank you all for listening and go learn more about the Austrian Lorenz. Check it out.